Hello, everyone. I think everything should be working, so do kindly let me know if you are able to hear my voice. I am not streaming from the normal location today and uh, had to set everything up to do this remotely. Um, so hopefully it's all working. Hi, Hannah. Welcome, welcome. Um, I'm going to... I, I kind of have to turn to the side to see one of the chats. So going to try and not do that too much, but... Um, hopefully captions are working on both channels. Um, let me know if they're not working, uh, but they should be on and hopefully making as much sense as automatic captions normally do. Um, I do want to go ahead and start with the uh, acknowledgements that we normally do. So um, uh, today we are going to do the... Uh, Denim Day at Virginia Tech 40th Anniversary Oral History Collection, which is an LGBTQ plus focused collection. Um, and we'll be sharing a lot of video content, um, which is the only reason I'm able to do this remotely today. Um, but first, we acknowledge the Tutelo and Monokan people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live and recognize their continuing connection to the land, water and air that Virginia Tech consumes. We pay respect to the Tudalo and Monacan nations and to their elders past, present, and emerging. We also acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus was previously the site of the Smithfield Plantation. At any point from 1774 to 1865, the Preston family enslaved 40 to 100 African men, women, and children on this land. We pay respect to those souls and acknowledge that Virginia Tech is undeniably tied to this legacy. Further, we acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus was previously the site of the Solitude Estate, which enslaved at least 30 African men, women, and children on this land. We acknowledge the contributions of the Fraction family and other enslaved persons in the creation and emergence of Virginia Tech as a major land-grant university. There's one last item that I do want to mention today. Um, I had considered doing either this uh, LGBT focused collection or um, the April 16th condolence collection today. I ultimately decided not to do April 16th because it's a collection that I don't want to share without being able to prepare ahead of time. Um, and I have not had time on site to be able to go through materials and, and select what would be shared on stream. Uh, so I chose not to do that one, and I'm probably not going to do that one this year. I will probably plan on doing that next year around this time, um, when presumably we will be back in the library full time, and I will have a chance to pull items from the collection and kind of screen them before they come on stream. Um, that said, I do want to go ahead and... Um, point everyone if you are interested in learning about that collection we do have a digital exhibit up uh, that just went up uh, for the 14th um, the 14th anniversary of the shootings here at Virginia Tech um, so if you go to our site which is digital sc.lib.vt.edu um, it is the featured collection at the moment and um, the exhibit is called We Are Better Than We Think Selections from the April 16th, 2007 Condolence Archives, and it highlights items Virginia Tech received following the events of April 16th, uh, featuring artifacts, children's letters, poems, and more with messages of love, hope, and peace. Um, and many of the items in the digital exhibit have not been shared before. Um, it's, they've not been displayed as part of ex exhibits in the past. So I would encourage you to take a look at that exhibit if you are at all interested. Um, it is available online on our website. Um, I will drop that link in the chats. I'm not sure if my moderators have arrived today, so I will do that myself. Uh... I can drop a link straight to the exhibit if I
that will work. Bear with me, bear with me. This is uh, not the normal setup for today. So just taking me a couple of seconds longer to get to everything. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Uh, we have a tiny URL that will take you straight to the exhibit. Tinyurl.com slash April 16, 2021, exhibit. Hey, there's Kira with it just before I was able to type it in. Thank you, Kira. Um, so as I said, we won't be actually visiting that exhibit today. Um, that is not what we're going to be focusing on today. But I did want to uh, go ahead and point it out for you and let you know that it's there. Um, that was potentially the topic for today, uh, but we will not be focusing on that. We're going to focus on the um, Denim Day instead. So I'm going to go ahead and take us there. Um, this is our online site, digital or digitalsc.lib.vt.edu, where our digitized collections are housed. Um, it is built on Omeka and it has some customization to it that makes things that that is not functioning properly. Um, and at some point in time, we will upgrade to a different platform that will clean up some of this. But uh, under the exhibits here, um, these are all the different exhibits we've put together. And here we have Denim Day at Virginia Tech. So <clears throat> Denim Day uh, for Virginia Tech. I know there's an event. Um, there's something called Denim Day that is done at campuses around the country that has to do with um, a women's rights topic that I cannot recall at the moment. That is not what this is. This is um, an event that was held in 1979 here at Virginia Tech as part of the first Gay Awareness Week. Um, the uh, GSA, the Gay Student Alliance here at Virginia Tech, put together this event. Um, and Denim Day was just one of the days of the week. They had a whole week of events. Denim Day happened on, uh, I believe it was Wednesday of the week. Um, and it was simply... The GSA was asking people, wear jeans if you support gay rights. Um, they were not well received. Uh, the, the interviews talk a lot about um, people in the GSA waking up Wednesday and going out in their jeans and everywhere they went, everybody was wearing slacks, girls were in dresses. It, the day actually happened in the middle of January, so it was cold, it was muddy. Um, people dressed up rather than wear jeans, and jeans were what people were usually wearing on campus. So people went out of their way. Uh, the shops in town, according to the interviews, sold out of things like khakis um, because people went out and bought pants to wear rather than wear jeans on this day. Um, so it is a piece of Virginia Tech history. Um, and uh, a couple of years ago, it would have been 2019. 2019 was the 40th anniversary. So starting in 2018, um, an alumnus contacted Special Collections and contacted the university generally to talk about doing something for the upcoming anniversary of this event. Um, and this oral history project was part of that. Um, and so I was involved in, in helping to organize this. Um, so there was a alumni relations thing. I don't actually know if this site is, is live anymore. I'm going to open the tab, or open the link and we'll see. Okay, so our link is pointing to the Wayback Machine. Um, this was the 40th anniversary commemoration that we had put together um, as a campus. 
taking a minute to load here. Um, so 40 years ago, during the week of January 15th to 19th, the Virginia Tech Gay Student Alliance held the first Gay Awareness Week, a multi-event effort to promote awareness of gay and lesbian people throughout campus. The high point was Denim Day, which called on all students, faculty, and staff to show their support of gay rights by wearing denim on that day. And so during Pride Week, which is now held in April, um, in 2019, Denim Day was revived with what was being called a Denim Day do-over. Um, and in 2019, people were asked once again to show support for the LGBTQ plus community by wearing denim. Uh, and then again this year, uh, just last Friday, uh, Denim Day was held again. Uh, so it is a semi-regular thing now, I guess, or at least planned to be. Um, but yeah, there were a number of events. Uh, if I pull up the schedule here, the Wayback Machine is somewhat slow. So we'll, we'll see. Um, oh, <laughs> here we go. Uh, Tuesday of the commemorative week, there was a radio broadcast um, that I was involved in, uh, hosted by me. Um, then there was a reception, the Denim Day do-over with an actual like photo being taken. Uh, Jean's noticeably absent, which I will play a couple of clips from, um, was a live on stage documentary about the event. Uh, and then another reception, a party, um, and then in Roanoke, Virginia, the, the week ended with the premiere of a documentary called The Unlikely Story of the Lesbians of First Friday, um, which a number of the alumni involved in the Denim Day stuff were also involved in. So it was sort of a big deal because we got a bunch of LGBTQ, well, I should just say, we got a bunch of lesbian and gay uh, alumni to return to campus for the first time in 40 years because they had come here and did not feel welcome while they were here. Um, but I think we'll start. I'm going to play this kind of little promotional video that we had for Denim Day uh, that kind of talks, gives a little overview of everything, and I will stop talking for a minute and we'll just play this video. Yep. Thanks, Hannah. I just realized that you all couldn't hear the audio because I didn't have desktop audio turned on. Let me rewind that and I will try again. And I need to turn off Pretzel because the music is playing. And shouldn't be. Lots of moving pieces. <laughs> Alright, let's try this one more time. Let's call it a Denim Day do-over. Let me know if it's too loud. My name is Nancy Kelly, and I was the first lesbian co-president of the Gay Student Alliance in 1978 here in Blacksburg. We decided we wanted to make people more aware um, of our presence and also um, the issues that we faced. And so as an organization, we had a Gay Awareness Week in January of 1979, had a number of programs, a radio show coming out day, panel discussion. But one of the things that we, we did, which we co-opted from, I believe, ODU or another university that was nearby, we had a denim day. And the message was very simple, support gay rights, wear denim. As soon as we published their, our intention of having this week, Blacksburg absolutely erupted. Local merchants reported record sales of khakis and dress clothes and corduroys. We were uh, taunted, ridiculed, we were verbally and physically assaulted. 
we had supporters, we had allies, we had, you know, it was just a time when we became public and let people know that gay people and lesbians were Are you here? Am I here? I don't know if I'm visible. I don't know if I can be seen. Hi! <laughs> uh, I believe a raid happened. Um, hi, 16-Bit Eric. Thank you, everybody, for coming over. Uh, this is Archival Adventures. It is a show that I do on Wednesdays. Um, at 2.30 p.m. where I share materials from the Virginia Tech um, Special Collections and University Archives. So welcome in, everybody. Wraith, thank you for the, the 500 bits. Um, today, I, I am set up doing this remotely um, rather than uh, at the library how I normally do. Um, there was uh, some stuff that required me to actually stay physically here today. So um, I've got it set up. I'm sharing a digital collection uh, called the um, Denim Day at Virginia Tech uh, 40th Anniversary Oral History Collection. Denim Day was a day in 1979 when the Gay Student Alliance asked people to wear jeans to show support for gay rights. And um, so we did some interviews a couple years ago, and I have video interviews um, where people talked about what it was like being in the GSA, organizing the event, what the day was like, what happened. Um, so that is what's going on. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the raid happened and things broke. So I, I'm doing my best to try and make this all work uh, from home. Uh, things crashed out for a minute. Hopefully that doesn't happen again. But if you are at all interested in some um, LGBTQ plus history, I encourage you to stick around and we will have um, this stream up where I'm going to share clips from these oral histories. Uh, these are Virginia Tech alumni who were estranged from the university because they didn't feel welcome as members of the LGBTQ plus community and uh, returned to Virginia Tech after 40 years to share their story. Um, so uh, yeah, that's that's what we got. Um, so uh, I encourage people to stick around and we'll watch some of these uh, clips from these interviews together. Um, and yeah. Uh, hi, Orangitis. Uh, hi, hi, Beth. Uh, everybody who who came in on the raid, it's good to see you all. Uh, Chandra, <laughs> Wraith with the bits, uh, Meaning of Night, uh, Kistabras. Um, yeah, and also, uh, if you are at all interested, um, Virginia Tech University Libraries also has their own Twitch channel where this show airs as well as. Um, uh, TTRPG uh, live play on Friday evenings. Uh, last Friday, I GM'd a Cypher System game on the channel um, based on Isaac Asimov and Robert Silverberg's novel Nightfall. Um, so that is over at twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios. Uh, so if you're interested in that um, type of content, feel free to give a follow over there as well. Um, I'm going to we're going to try this one more time and see if I can get this video to play properly. 
um, without crashing the stream. Uh, so let me give this a shot and see what happens. Oh, I got to switch views so you can see it. There we go. My name is Nancy Kelly, and I was the first lesbian co-president of the Gay Student Alliance in 1978 here in Blacksburg. We decided we wanted to make people more aware um, of our presence and also um, the issues that we faced. And so as an organization, we had a Gay Awareness Week in January of 1979 had a number of programs, a radio show coming out day, panel discussion. But one of the things that we, we did, which we co-opted from, I believe, ODU or another university that was nearby, we had a denim day. And the message was very simple. Support gay rights. Wear denim. As soon as we published their, our intention of having this week, Blacksburg absolutely erupted. Local merchants reported record sales of khakis and dress clothes and corduroys. We were uh, taunted, ridiculed. We were verbally and physically assaulted. We had supporters. We had allies. We had, you know, it was just a time when we became public and let people know that gay people and lesbians were their classmates, their brothers, their professors, their sisters. People did not appreciate us standing up for ourselves. And the next year we went to do Denim Day again, and we were banned. We were told we could not do it again. We had to, in a few minutes, decide to do another event. But what is important about Denim Day now is that for many of us, it has been 40 years, and we are coming back to campus for the first time. And there is such power in in our stories, and what I am so deeply appreciative of is that the Special Collections Department is capturing our stories, and we have oral histories online, and um, it's important that students now know that we have always been here, and that we support them, and that if they want to hear our stories, we do, you know, we do have them for people to view. So that's the short little introduction that we made for the collection. Um, see if I can shrink down this video. Sorry. There we go. Um, the collection of interviews is located at digital.sc. Or sorry, digitalsc.lib.vt.edu, which is the Special Collections and University Archives online site. Um, I think. Kira has dropped it in the chats, so if you're interested in peeking at it over there, that'd be great. Um, this is an oral history collection. Uh, we recorded a series of video interviews um, with people who were significant for the event in 1979. So you just saw a, uh, Nancy Kelly um, giving some overview in, in that overview video. Uh, Nancy was the one who really was the driving force behind this entire project to look at this aspect of Virginia Tech history and managed to recruit all of these people to come back to a school where they had not felt, felt welcome while they attended and share their story. Um, and I am incredibly grateful to her for that. Um, but yeah, the plan today is just to click into some of these, get some clips and highlights, um, kind of learn about what happened in 1979. Um, Lisa and Mark Barroso here. Uh, that's going to be an interesting interview when I get to it. Mark, uh, if you remember from the little video that just played, there was an, a newspaper image of a bunch of guys wearing skirts. Um, in response to being asked to wear denim in support of gay rights. Um, Mark was one of those guys, according to the memories of everybody here except Mark. Uh, and so it's an interesting interview with him and his lesbian sister, Lisa. Um, <clears throat> but we'll look at that one in a minute. I'm going to start with uh, Helene Vachon here. Um, 
So the description of the video here, uh, in this interview, Helene talks about realizing her sexuality in Catholic school in the early 1970s and her time as a lesbian at Virginia Tech in the late 1970s. She talks about the difficulty being out while keeping that part of her life secret from her or separate from her st studies and work in animal sciences and how important the Gay Student Alliance was for her. She goes on to talk about her experience of Denim Day in 1979 while, while living both out and closeted on the Virginia Tech campus. So I'm going to start with... We'll jump straight into the Denim Day segment here. So how, how active were you in, in the planning of those events? Well, I was more or less of a bit of a worker bee, and um, but I was active in uh, I was at the meetings, the GSA meetings, and giving my two cents. And I thought it was a wonderful idea they'd come up with because there was some other college that had done it. I think San Francisco had done this, and we wanted to make an impact of how we can get people to think and. A few days before Denim Day, we had other activities that would, you know, lead up to that. And Wednesday, being the big Denim Day, we had these flyers that we were going to put under every dorm room. And I kept one of the flyers. And uh, it was a picture of a closet. With, Wednesday is Denim Day. Wear your jeans in support of gay rights. We didn't say, you know, wear your jeans if you're gay. <laughs> wear your jeans if you support gay rights. And I helped uh, uh, passing uh, those flyers out in the middle of the night in the dorm room and one, two, three, or four o'clock in, uh, in the morning we're doing this and going as, running as fast as we can because every one, now and then there's somebody would open up their door and come out and scream, lesbians, oh my goodness, there's lesbians on the hall. <laughs> and we'd run and at one point Nancy, she blew somebody a kiss and she screamed. We thought, oh my God, they're so silly. So, <laughs> We wanted to be taken seriously. Our, I think our biggest fear was that they would ignore us and just wear their jeans because everybody on tech campus wore jeans. I mean, it was 99% of the people every day, day in and day out, wore jeans. So we wanted to get them to, so we wanted them to think. It was a lesson in oppression because we had, we woke up every day thinking, you're gay, you know, and put on your, your mask. We wanted them to think. We go have our, after we pass out all the flyers, we go and have a little breakfast. And we were like, oh, we did it, we did it. And some of the guys had been chased. And because uh, uh, guys at that time, they could get beat up. You were really putting yourself out there. And um, we we were afraid we were gonna, you know, we could have gotten beat up too and could have kicked off or something. So we got away with it. We wake up the next day. It's like we, we went to bed for a couple hours. We wake up and um, I put my jeans on and I walk into my organic chemistry class. I walk in at the bottom and I look up and nobody was wearing their jeans. And I was looking and looking, I couldn't, and it was, my eyes caught, there was this one guy there and he's in the middle and he looks down at me and we look at each other like, oh, found one. We kind of gave each other, like smiled at each other, like, wow, oh, I'm okay, I got one. We were okay, I sat down. And the professor made some kind of a joke as if you weren't wearing your jeans today, you'd have to do some homework or something like that. Again, and so and I thought about it, and it's like, it perturbed me. And I'm like, another joke at the expense of homosexuals. You know, and you, you're always living with this. And I, thought, and I thought, is there any professor on this campus that's gonna speak up? I was like, I was hopeful, say something nice. Say something nice, and he couldn't put, you know, you had to just, a, a joke at the expense of us. So, I sat, I would sit next to this guy in organic chemistry class, and we would walk back and forth to class together. And he was a very, this guy was very good looking, very nice, and, and I think back and I thought, why? This guy, why would he, he would talk to me and engage with me? Because, you know, men, good-looking men never talked to me because I knew I was going around. I had the psychic sign of, don't you look at me, don't talk to me. 
you know. So here's this guy I had befriended, he was, and we'd walk back and forth to class. And after class, I said, hey, I said, you're not wearing your jeans today. I wasn't out to him. He goes, yeah, he goes, they were dirty. He goes, I didn't have time to wash them. And, uh, and then he said, well, he goes, I, but I think it's an abomination to God. Gay people are an abomination to God. And he went on with this litany, on and on, and I just went, oh, oh. And I said, well, I said, I'm wearing my jeans. He goes, yeah, but I know you're not gay. And so uh, I didn't say anything. And I thought, I'm going to let him think on that. And we walked off, walked away. What makes you think I'm not gay? You know? There are a lot of good moments in her interview. It's a really good interview. <clears throat> she was in um, uh, Animal Husbandry, that type of program. Um, so uh, she talks a little bit about what, what it's like to be in that program um, as a member of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, it's... Honestly, they're all really good <laughs> interviews. Um, and I, so I was involved in the production of these, uh, <clears throat> mostly in coordinating, um, getting people together and then getting the videos processed and doing the captioning and, and stuff like that. So if you do have questions following, inter uh, following a clip um, or questions about the project at all, do feel free to ask and I will be happy to answer questions. Um, want to let's see we'll go to andrew alvarez next um an index on okay his has been transcribed but not indexed yet so it's gonna pick a spot and we'll start <laughs> um Start at the beginning. There's a little bit of like setup stuff. Well, we'll just start at the very beginning and we'll play a little bit of his interview. Can I have like a oh. 40 minutes on the battery and I can always change it so it's not okay. time. Um, so we'll just chat. So you, you can't see you can't see Okay, much. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hiding. <laughs> Adjusting. Uh, I'm so glad we were able to connect. It's really, um, it's really oh, nice dear. for me to be a part of this from my aunt. Pause it. Uh -huh. Wait for the stream to catch up. It seems to be struggling just a little bit. Um, Okay. Let me know if things have cleared up. Uh everything seemed to be a little messy. <clears throat> Try. I'm gonna try and push play again and see what happens. Um, she's always been my favorite friend of mine. My bad. She's an incredible woman, and she um, she's hilarious. She's hilarious. And she's out of there, irreverent. I love her. Yes. Yeah, yeah, she is. And um, yeah, when I talk to her about this, it's like it's yeah, that did not seem to. Fix it for me. How is it working for everybody else when I try and play the video?
I'm going to try and reduce the load on this computer. Um, all right. I'm closing some things and we'll see what happens. Okay, let me try once more, and we'll see if it works. It was a really works. meaningful like, moment in her life, um, so it's nice to be a part of that in some way 40 years later, um, yeah. sitting down with you, so thank you. And, and too, it's a reminder to the folks that have followed us, you know, uh, it didn't just happen. Mm -hmm. what, what you see today and sort of the freedoms that, that you may enjoy. Uh, All right. Uh, give me one second, and I'm going to just real quick restart OBS and see if that, restarting that connection will, uh, <clears throat> I think things are working again. Um, it's all experimental at this point. So uh, I'm going to give this a go. Try playing this and see what happens. Uh, most people uh, across the U.S. They didn't just happen. They they were fought for. You know, every inch of them. <laughs> frankly, in, in inside for, for each of us. Well, so that interview doesn't seem to want to play. I'm going to attempt to do one of the other ones and see if it works out any better. And they raised the idea of the um, Gay Awareness Week, which, is, which was the first time anything like that had happened at, at TAC. Um, and that was, I believe, in January 79. And we were discussing what activities to do. And the concept of Denim Day came up. And, and other colleges and universities had done that. I think Penn State even had done it, if not that year or the year before. So it wasn't a novel idea, but we thought it was a great idea. Um, for a couple of reasons. One, it would definitely bring awareness to gay issues, gay people here at Virginia Tech. Because those, for the most part, those of us that were gay, we weren't necessarily out. We weren't, you know, walking around with rainbow flags draped over our shoulders. Uh, we weren't participating in marches. It was a, sort of an unspoken, you just knew. Um, 
And those that knew gay people weren't out either. They was like, oh, my friend's not gay. No, no, I don't know any gay people. Uh, so this was a big event to to raise awareness. And denim, of course, being the uniform of choice at Virginia Tech and I guess all college campuses, we thought, well, let's let's do it. And there was twofold to the choosing denim day. And I think the one kind of gets lost, but the initial one is okay, you wear denim, boom. Now everyone is aware um, that you're gay or you support gay rights, which is really what the denim was supposed to symbolize, that you support gay rights, not that you are gay. Mm -hmm. uh, but people were afraid that people would misconstrue and interpret that, oh, they're gay. Um, the second reason we, we picked denim is Denim is so natural for people to get up in the morning. It's part of who they are. They throw it on. They don't think about it. Um, unlike gay people at the time, we got up every single day and we had to consciously think about what we said, how we moved, our, our hand gestures, what we wore. Because if we didn't calculate that correctly, people were going to brand us as, as gay, as homosexuals, as faggots, as queers. And... We didn't want that. So what happened on Denim Day is the, the student body got up and they had to make a conscious choice about what they wore, how they behaved that day, so they would not be categorized as gay. And I think that kind of got lost in, in the whole event that for that brief moment of that day, they were subjected to what we had been subjected to all our lives. The, the harassment, the ridiculing, you know, people making fun of us, um, the discrimination, the, the bullying, even though it wasn't called bullying back then. I don't even think there was such a thing as bullying. It was just what people did. And it, was, it was horrible, but it wasn't labeled as bullying. And I think it was more acceptable. Well, I'm glad that that video <laughs> worked. Um... This was Scott Beadle talking. Uh, Scott <clears throat> was originally from Northern Virginia um, and came to Virginia Tech um, to study. Oh, I don't remember what he originally studied. I know he switched into studying theater. Um, he went on to be a corporate trainer for Wendy's, I believe. Um, member of the Gay Student Alliance during the first Gay Awareness Week, helped to plan Denim Day in 1979, uh, originally studied engineering and then switched into theater arts. Uh, he served as president of the Gay Student Alliance. Um, <clears throat> and in his interview, he talks about the motivations behind Denim Day, experiences of other gay students living on campus in the late 70s and 80s, and how things have changed on campus and in our society over the last 40 years. I'm going to play another clip from his where he talks about life at Virginia Tech after Denim Day and some classroom panels that um, the Gay Student Alliance members were involved in um, in the 70s. And I believe these have continued um, roughly until today. I'm not sure exactly how long they've gone on. I do know that um, they definitely continued into the 20 or it, into the 2020s. Whether they're still happening now, I don't know. So can we step back and talk a little bit more about um, your life at Tech and the theater okay. and maybe uh -huh. some of um, some of the other things you may have been into around campus? Uh. Well, when I was an engineering student, didn't spend a whole lot of time doing much else but studying. I mean, you know, it's tough. You know, yeah. I, I was telling my sister this the other day. Tech back then, I don't know what it's like now. Tech back then was kind of easy to get into, but hard to stay in. So you really had to study. You really had to work hard. I didn't have a real big circle of friends. Uh, I had the Gay Student Alliance, but... Not like we were hanging out because we'd get labeled. Um, so I studied a lot. And my one roommate, the end of my sophomore year, was a theater major. And that's how I got introduced into the 
theater. Apartment. And once I switched my major, then I just focused all my energies at the, that creative outlet. Uh, still was involved my junior year with the Gay Student Alliance, even though we didn't get approved for that second uh, denim day. And the president didn't let us know that until we were in front of what whoever it was, the student government or whatever, that had to approve all the student events. on, And he didn't let us know that they were not going to approve that until we were sitting in front of them. And then that's when I found out the governor of Virginia had called him and said, how could you let something like this happen? Found out all that, all the letters. I mean, I read the editorials in the local paper and the Collegiate Times and guys going running around in skirts to protest Denim Day. I'm like, you know, who's the gay one here? Uh, <laughs> so um, I don't know if that answered your question. That's okay. <laughs> uh, So, yeah, we could stay with that if you want and talk yeah. more about the reaction um, and the aftermath of Denim Day. Well, I, I mean, at that point, for lack of a better word, I was a celebrity at that point because everybody knew who I was. And I was going to classes and, and teaching on, or talking on panel discussions. Uh, they'd have them in various sociology, psychology classes, human development. And there'd be three or four of us on a panel and the class would ask questions, you know, and I like that. I really like that aspect. That was the educational platform um, because it was broadening people's, you know, horizons and intelligence. And they were learning about us and realizing we weren't as scary. Um, but then at the same time, I remember I was um, dating uh, an individual who was in a fraternity, didn't want any of his frat buddies to know. Um, we couldn't be seen together in public. Yep, the video is buffering again. On that. And we would we would study together, but he would get to Newman at a certain time, and then I would have to arrive a half hour later. And then I would leave Newman, and he would leave 15, 20 minutes later. So we couldn't be seen in his mind going to a place together, leaving a place together. Um, and Newman, we would found a nice little place that we could study in one of those cubicles and not be seen. Um so that was didn't work well for me. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, that's where he was. That was his paranoia, his own homophobia. And I remember in a panel discussion, we were talking one time, and one guy sitting there with the frat hat and the frat sweatshirt, and he just being so belligerent and so attacking in his questions. And I just said to him, you know, you don't really know who is gay and who's not. So you should be careful, um, you know, what you're saying. And, uh, oh, by the way, I'm dating somebody from your fraternity. Well, the class erupted at that point. because Even the class was starting to turn on him. He was being just so ignorant. And he, he just slumped <laughs> down in his chair. But I'm sure then he went back to his fraternity and was always like, I was like, good. <laughs> good, good for you. Um, do you know how that played out? In the no, I don't. I don't. I obviously, I'm not dating the guy that I was dating back then. Um, well, what was your reaction? So uh, in that, he, he talked a little bit about the um, <clears throat> classroom panels. Essentially, it was a psychology class. Um, I believe it was an abnormal psychology class that uh, the professor invited in members of the LGBTQ plus community to sit on a panel and talk to the class, answer questions, basically put a human face on um, homosexuality uh, for the class. And for many people in the class, it was one of the first times they had ever met somebody physically in person who identified as gay um <clears throat> so it, it it comes up in a number of the interviews on here because a number of the people that we interviewed actually took part and, and were on panels for that class 
Um, there was mention there of the reaction and the uh, the governor. Um, you've been on both sides of panels like that. Um, I think overwhelmingly the reaction of the people doing these interviews uh, was that they felt the panels were a good idea. I've never actually been involved in a panel like that on either side. Um, so I don't know how I would react. Um, but yeah, I think uh, everybody who was reflecting on having been on those panels um, in these interviews definitely felt like those panels were ultimately a good thing. Um, what did you think, Beth? Uh, did you think that they were good to have or not? <laughs> Things have t changed a ton in the past five years. Yeah, um, they definitely have. Um, I don't know which newspaper article I want to have at the time they were important oh no that, that's totally fine um, top for bare feet Well, we'll just jump in. Um, so the video that I'm at right now is called Jeans Noticeably Absent, The Story of Denim Day 1979. Um, this was a live documentary. So clips from the interviews interspersed with readings from the newspaper at the time um, so the the newspapers were read by some theater arts students and then clips of the interviews were interspersed with them to kind of structure a documentary about denim day um it was ultimately put together uh and like scripted into a cohesive narrative by one of the professors of theater arts at virginia tech um susanna reinhardt and uh I prepared the clips, uh, did the video editing for the clips, and then actually did the video editing and arranged the captioning of the recording of the actual event. Um, I don't remember which newspaper articles specifically talk about the reaction, but uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and, and play some of the newspaper articles so that we can get some of that as well as well as the interview segments um if this will play we'll see uh hopefully january it does. 19 1979 collegiate times to the editor on behalf of all the straight men on campus we would like to thank the gay student alliance for holding denim day we haven't seen so many well-dressed women in skirts since we don't know when Bob Looney, Cass Lawrence, and Charlie McCauley. To the editor. Just a thought. If this week is Gay Awareness Week, why was it that the Gay Student Alliance flyers advertising Denim Day were distributed in my dorm between 2 and 3 a.m.? Was the GSA representative or, or supporter ashamed of something? John Wiley, Junior Communications. I think in my case, though, it wasn't. It didn't come out of a healthy place. It came out of. <laughs> it came out of. Um, you know, I was raised by uh, a, 
mil I was, came from a military family. My father was a, a lifer. He was a Marine. Um, and uh, Catholic and Cuban, and I was the firstborn son. So I had a lot of baggage that I had to throw off. And so for me, the whole activism thing, that period, was survival. It was, it was not sort of an acknowledgement. It was, I'm here, I'm not going to go away. You know, I'm here, I'm queer, I'm not going to go out. You know, it was more like uh, stepping into an identity, or stepping into my own identity, and this was sort of part of it. Uh, but I'm really convinced I would have been dead five, seven years if I had stayed in that mindset that was so negative and so repressive. Um, when I got the invite to speak to a class, it's a sociology class, in the winter of 77, somebody, word of mouth, somebody, and this professor calls me, wanted me to come in and uh, speak to his um, social deviance class, which, you know, on the surface, it's today we'd say that's a little offensive, but at the time it was more like, well, I guess that's what gay lifestyles come under, you know. And my experience of that was so empowering. I didn't have to do anything. I just showed up and I answered questions. It was a review class, um, sociology. Uh, review class. So there's probably about 150, 200 people in the room. And it was liberating because they were expecting a freak. And I wasn't a freak. And, you know, I was just sort of like myself. And um, I think just by showing up, I helped to dispel a lot of their stereotypes. And, that, and for me, it was uh, acknowledging and, and, you know, it was an ego trip at first. Um, and the student group sort of evolved around that time, and it was the, mostly the women, uh, Nancy taking the lead, um, and Sue Ann. And, you know, there are a few people that kind of pop out of me, and, and there were a few guys, but they were more, you know, they didn't really want to be um, out there. Um, so I identified more with the lesbians, <laughs> I, have to, I have to admit. And to this day, really, uh, you know, uh, a lot of sort of my values and where I come from, I think. So, but um, that's how it started for me. It was a, it was an invite to speak to a sociology class. that got repeated, and then I would bring people with me and that kind of thing. But my parents, who had told me nothing gay when you go off to college, I, we don't want to see hear or see anything. My mom called me that weekend. I was trying to make my mind up about speaking to this class. She calls me and she tells me, "Well, if you do it, I'm disowning you." And she did for a couple of years. Um, and I said, well, gosh, thanks for calling, Mom, because you really helped. <laughs> that, that's sort of my attitude. It's is like, really? So, uh, so for me, it was more a psychological necessity that I'd get up and I'd speak. I'd be there. I'd be present. I'd be <sighs> that I exist uh, and not stay invisible. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's what it was. It was I'd, I'd say with Nancy, this is a total projection on my part, she was much healthier in her, in her I mean, who she was, and, and, and for me, it was sort of a, it was a, a journey um, to uh, find myself. And that's, I was 18, 19, 20 years old. Um, and um, in that sense, it was extremely positive. <clears throat> so that's a little more on kind of the, the sociology class and what that was. Um, I want to do a couple more of the newspaper articles and then we'll dive into one of the other interviews. Let's do a letter to the editor. Uh, We'll do both of these. So we'll start with this one first. January 16th, 1979. Collegiate Times to the editor. Having read all the articles degrading the Gay Awareness Week and the letters to the editor section of the January 12th issue of the Collegiate Times, I would like to humbly congratulate all the writers in an extremely effective display of their ignorance. 
Tony Perone, in your letter you seem to be quite worried about how you appear to other people. I'm pleased that you are wearing corduroys to show everyone where you stand on the view of gay rights. However, Mr. Perone, I believe you missed the point in your question addressed to the gay community. Were you trying to get people to dress like they supported the gay cause? Were you that worried that you would, wouldn't get enough support? I feel that the purpose of the Gay Awareness Week is, to not, is not to gather support, but rather broaden the closed mind of individuals like yourself. The fact that denim was picked as a material to wear seems to deeply concern you. Uh, perhaps drawing this concern was the intended purpose. After all, the fact that you took the time to sit down and write your letter proves that Gay Awareness Week touched at least one person. You, Mr. Perone, are a victim of your own ignorance. As for the writers of Watch Out for Bare Feet, I'm elated to find four people who believe they are normal. <laughs> According to their letter, one can infer normal people have the instinctive ability to condemn others who don't act as they would. God, I'm glad this world is not strictly comprised of normal people. Finally, for the writers of Bring Your Toothbrush, in your letter you state, the authors of Denim Day were afraid to be different and be seen with their beliefs, where in actuality, it is you who are afraid of appearing as if you support any gay cause, or you would never advocate carrying a toothbrush to prevent the social embarrassment of association with the gay community. I feel sorry for all of you. Mark Erickson, Finance. <laughs> February 13th, 1979, Collegiate Times. Note, the following letter was written by a member of the Virginia Tech Gay Student Alliance. If the author's name were revealed, it could threaten his job. The CT does not print unsigned letters, so I am submitting his letter under my name. To the editor and the Virginia Tech community, some of us are your parents, children, brothers and sisters, friends, teachers, employers, and athletic heroes. We were burned at the stake by the thousands during the Middle Ages. We were the second largest minority exterminated at Buchenwald and Auschwitz, although history books seldom mention us in those contexts. We are still the butt of jokes and the target of violence in America today. Many of us have contributed to the arts, sciences, and all of the other areas of human ingenuity, but most of us are ordinary people living ordinary lives. We aren't sexual perverts or lost sinners. The professional psychological and psychiatric associations have stated that we aren't sick, and an increasing number of theologians are beginning to reevaluate their positions on the basis of more accurate understandings of scripture and cultural history. We aren't any more promiscuous than anyone else. Some of us have had partners with whom we've shared our lives for 30 years or more. We aren't lonely because we have children, relatives, and friends who love us and accept us for who we are. We don't often conform to your stereotypes of us, so you probably wouldn't recognize us if you saw us walking across the drill field or shopping in Kroger's. Because we are people first, though we happen to be gay, and because human beings have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, we feel justified in expecting the rights to which we are thus entitled. We aren't asking for anything that Americans don't take for granted. We simply want to live without fear for our dignity, our jobs, our lives. We want people to acknowledge that those who are different from the majority aren't acting immorally or illegally, only differently from the rest. A few of you wore denim on Wednesday to indicate your support of our struggle for human rights. On behalf of the gay community of Blacksburg and of Virginia, I thank my straight brothers and sisters for their help in our struggle but many more of you had to search your wardrobes for something other than jeans. Most of you are straight, but some are gay or unsure of your sexual orientation. Some of you hate us irrationally. Others are ignorant, and still others are afraid of the remarks which might be directed at you. I understand you all, because I once felt as you do. I'm sorry if you felt oppressed, but my gay sisters and brothers and I feel oppressed every day by a straight society which forbids us to be ourselves. If someone you love and respect were to tell you that he or she is gay, would your attitude toward gay people and their rights change? Remember that one of every ten people you know is gay. And remember that as long as even one member of our society is oppressed, none of us is free. Sue Ann Brown, Architecture, Member, Gay Student Alliance. Yeah, Beth, um... You went to college in 2000 to 2004, and you thought that nobody there was gay, 
uh, especially trans, um, and later learned that there was an LGBT group. And I feel like that is a fairly common experience. <clears throat> um, I was an undergrad in 97, and um, I know that was around the time that the school that I was attending was forming um, an LGBT group. Um, but for many reasons, the student groups often end up not being well advertised or not being um, easy to find. And, and yeah, okay, so you weren't even out to yourself back then. Um, but even so, like, this is... Um, just even being aware that the group existed shouldn't have been a challenge, but uh, it's not really surprising that it was. Um, this event, the Denim Day event, actually was part of an entire week of events called Gay Awareness Week um, that actually continued for quite a long time and eventually turned into the current Pride Week at Virginia Tech. So the very first one, the Gay Awareness Week, happened in um, January of 1979 and continues essentially until today um, with Pride Week, which was last week. Um, I want to... don't know if it's in Nancy's interview or Sherry's interview. Um, so Sherry... Wood, uh, who I'm going to try and play a clip from, um, was the editor of the Collegiate Times, which is the co campus newspaper, um, during Gay Awareness Week and Denim Day. Um, so she had some control over the press coverage of it on campus. Uh, see if her video will play. So your connection to Denim Day then uh, comes out of part uh, in great part because you were editor in chief of the newspaper by this time. So when did that happen? When did you? Was it only your senior year, or when did you become editor in chief? And um, talk a little bit about how that then gave you a platform or gave uh, the community, the school community, a platform to promote. Denim Day and to write about it, you know, how do you connect to Denim Day as as the editor? Well, yes, of course, because we were covering events related to the Gay Student Alliance, I was connected in that fashion to Denim Day and, and GSA topics in general. But it, it's also true that I was, a, I was a junior that year I was editor. In November of 78, Harvey Milk in San Francisco was assassinated along with the mayor. And in fact, I just read that Diane Feinstein was the one who discovered his body, uh, the California senator, um, and made the announcement to sort of calm everybody down at the time. Uh, it, I remember it came across, uh, we had an old Associated Press machine uh, that was in between the newspaper office and WUVT, WUVIT, the radio station, and it, it would ding if there was a big story. It would actually ring a little bell and the paper would churn out, kind of type out. And that story came over. And even though I, you know, I didn't, had never really heard of Harvey Milk, I, you know, the fact that he was shot and he was, you know, gay and was such an icon in the gay community, that did really, I remember it very distinctly. I remember that day in November. So it was just two months later, or a little less even, that uh, the GSA proposed Denim Day as an event. And so we covered it very routinely, you know, just an, almost like an announcement that it was happening. So Denim Day, just to briefly explain, I'm sure anybody watching this knows, but um, probably, was very straightforward, I thought. It was, if you support gay rights on this day, you know, wear denim. And that is, that was, you know, a visual, you know, message that you were in support of gay rights. And at the time, I thought, no big deal. You know, we put the thing in the paper. I forgot about it. And then as soon as it appeared, we literally started getting um, 
I would say we got at least 150 letters, which, you know, college students wrote letters to the editor then. You know, they would put pen to paper. But that, we might get for something, you know, we might get 10 letters or 20, but to get 150, and some, some of them are really um, hysterical or really, you know, just over the top, against gay rights, furious, feeling like people's rights were, straight people's lives and rights were being violated and that this was so unfair and just, there was outrage. There was real outrage. Obviously, you know, uh, probably half the letters were in support of Denim Day, but the, the writers of the letters that were against it were so much more, um, used so much more hyperbole and were just really, you know, just so much animosity. It was pretty amazing. I was taken aback. I did not expect that level of animosity. Now you had the top editorial as I saw on the page that day, and I think it's a good opportunity to, to explain to spell out a little bit what why Dedham Day uh, was such an assault on student sensibility in that in that time frame, I think you made that point in in your editorial about you know why why this this struck such a chord. But again, for those who may not make that connection or even understand the importance of denim <laughs> to a to a college student in the, in that time. Um, can you sp speak a little bit more about why denim? Like, as you said in your editorial, you know, why not a red scarf? And, and why that was a sort of a strategic idea? Well, you know, I have to say that even though I, you know, was friends with many people in the GSA, I wasn't in on the planning stages for the event. I think denim was a choice, a logical choice, because uh, Virginia Tech was a casual campus. There was a lot of plaid flannel. It was, it was cold there in the mountains, the Blue Ridge Mountains in the winter. So people dressed casually and practically and that at that time meant Levi's or denim. And denim in general in the late 70s, denim hats, denim vests, denim, their denim skirts were huge. I think I had two denim skirts. Uh, people had denim boots. So it was the acknowledged uniform of the Virginia Tech students. So for GSA to choose that as a way of sort of nudging people, you know, like, oh, you know, this thing you wear every day, um, this is now going to symbolize something. And, you know, are you comfortable with that? How do you feel about that? Uh, again, even though we had gotten this flood of letters in response to the announcement of Denim Day, I still, when I wrote the editorial, I still had this sort of naive thing that, you know, it was so clear to me, denim, okay, you're mad because one day you can't wear denim without making a political statement, a political statement you might not agree with. You, really, you feel outraged and violated and your rights are being trampled on because one day you can't wear denim. So that was the gist. It was very, I thought it was really simple. One day you can't wear denim, you're freaking out. What about people who are gay every day for them? in every way is their rights are trampled on, their choices are criticized, they die, they're dying, you know, they're being ostracized, they're losing jobs. So you're upset because you can't wear denim. My favorite line in the editorial, even now to this day, is where I said, think people, think. I love that. And to me, it was just, you know, it's, it's short. I, I, it might be 200 words. I, there wasn't, to me, it was just straightforward. Again, I was naive. The, we got a whole nother flood of letters after this editorial appeared. I see it's January 16, 1979, that were, you know, again, just as vituperative. So many people furious. Again, I, I, probably half were in favor of the event. Um, but still, when I wrote this, I still didn't fully grasp what it meant to the Virginia Tech community, this event, Denim Day. Beth, if you're still here, uh, thank you for coming by. Um, it, the VOD will be available on the VTUL Studios channel if you want to check it out. Um, and the interviews are available on the website, so they are there to be explored. Um, I want to, let's see, definitely want to get to Lisa and Mark. Uh, I'm going to play a clip from Nancy, though, first. And while I do that, I'm going to run to um, take a quick bio break 
while the video is playing. So I'll make sure it's running and then I'm going to step out for a second. Hopefully things don't break while I'm gone. Um, let's see. I want to play this clip from Nancy. So at that time, so one of the things that was going on in university campuses were having, they would have awareness weeks because part of it is, is people just didn't understand that their brothers, their sisters, their cousins, their roommates, their, their study mates were gay, lesbian, bisexual. Uh, and I'm just not saying trans because that really, and, and yes, trans, but it, it was just, you know, that just has a different timeline. So I, I, I cannot speak to that. So I, I want to honor them and not, sure. and not speak. But um, so part of what we wanted to do was to have an awareness week. And, and you know, it wasn't terribly original. <laughs> you know, we, there were some other colleges that had done it. And, and so we just, you know, we thought, well, we'll just have a week. And I'm sure in the, in the fall semester, we planned it or thought about it. It was to do a radio show. It was to have like a coming out day or by the way, I'm gay day. And um, then there was a panel discussion so that we could speak for ourselves. And then we do a denim day. Now, it had been done other places. And just, just you know, the whole issue, the, the only thing that we said at Denim Day was support gay rights where denim. Now, we know full, full well that every single student at Virginia Tech wore denim every day. And it was in the middle of the winter. Oh, of course they were wearing, but our point was really awareness. Um, people took it so literally. So, so, so basic. So, over the fall, we planned it, and then in in January, beginning of January, we went to this commission where we had to um, get a permission, and we got permission. And 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 Gay Awareness Week was only ten days later. I mean, it wasn't like this big thing. But as soon as there was a small little uh, newspaper article that just said. The Gay Student Alliance has been doing this. And, and we would very rarely use our names. It was spokeswoman, spokesperson. We did not want to have our names used. And, um, and with that came out in the newspaper on the beginning of January. And the campus absolutely erupted. It was stunning. And, and uh, people were outraged that we were going to co-opt their uh, dress choice for a day. And you also have to understand contextually, we had no cell phones. So there was one pay phone on every hall for 100 people. Uh, and they were all plugged into the wall. <laughs> and you had to know the number. Um, no social media. We were no laptops, no computers. We had flyers, newspaper articles, television and radio. But of course, television only had four, stan four stations. And so everything went through the Collegiate Times. And um, uh, so, so this little article um, created a huge uproar. And um, a, a record number of letters to the editor and um, outrage. People were furious and upset. And, you know, it's only 10 days. <laughs> we didn't, you know, and there was a lag time because a letter you had to actually write, put it in mail, whatever. Um, the university received 25,000 letters. Wow. 25,000. Now, it wasn't just in 10 days, but over the time period. So uh, the letters to the editor, some were beautiful and understood what we were trying to do, and others were vitriolic and hateful, you know. Let's put them in pink dorms and, you know, y'all are fine, but keep it to yourselves and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, um, it, part of what we did at the Gay Student Alliance, we made flyers. Um, one of the most effective things we did is we did this little half flyer with a, with, in a dorm room closet that had a, a, uh, a pair of jeans and a denim jacket. And it had a person's hand coming out of the closet. And we had a little army of people, maybe, I mean, the Gay Student Alliance was 20 at the most, five women, 15 guys, roughly. And so we had a little um, 
army of people on the night before Denim Day. We made thousands of flyers and we went under every single dorm room door and just said, don't forget, tomorrow's Denim Day. And so come Denim Day, we learned that the uh, Blacksburg merchants had more sales of dress clothing in the winter than you know had been recorded. Uh, people were pulling together their their corduroys, their red, you know anything but blue jeans. Um, some chose to wear denim skirts um, in to mock uh, us, and um, basically we went and there was a sea of corduroy. I mean, no one. And everyone knew what day it was. There was no, oh, is this today? Maybe a few people that lived off campus, you know, wore jeans and then somehow understood what the implication was. But, but again, there were no allies. So it's not like you would be an ally. The, the Campus Crusade, you know, refused and said, we're going to carry a toothbrush and wear jeans, but our toothbrush says we don't support gay rights. And, you know, we're just talking about basic human rights. It wasn't, <laughs> that's all we said, support gay rights, wear denim. Um, sorry, uh, <clears throat> in there, Nancy talks about um, 25,000 letters. Um, and I believe... I know there's documentation of somewhere in that range, 20, 25,000 letters, uh, that the assistant dean of students, I believe it was, had to handle and got so upset about receiving that many letters of complaint from around the state um, that he called in the, the heads of the Gay Student Alliance to tell them that they could not do that event again. Um, <clears throat> so that was a... Um, thing i i wish that we had the letters that they, they have not made it to the archives um that would be something that i would would have very much liked to have had for our collections but uh there are definitely multiple mentions of um it it was dean james dean who i believe it was dean dean that had to deal with it. Um, so yeah, it, if it wasn't James Dean, it was another name that was like that, that was just very <laughs> kind of a, an interesting name com combination there. Let's, let's pop in on Lisa and Mark Barroso. And um, so Mark worked at the Collegiate Times and attended Virginia Tech uh, in 1979 when the Gay Student Alliance held Gay Awareness Week and Denim Day. Um, he is reported to have been one of the guys that put on denim skirts to protest Denim Day. Um, he claims not to recall doing so. Uh, Lisa is his sister. She came to Virginia Tech in the fall after Denim Day, so the fall of 1979. So she was not here when it happened. But <clears throat> when she got here and became a member of the Gay Student Alliance herself and came out as a lesbian, um, that began a very long process of uh, education for Mark. And um, their, their story is humorous and interesting at the same time. Um, we'll start here. So yeah. So Mark, what was, what did you write? What did you, how did you were, you were on Tet Tech for Denim Day, Lisa came after, right? Just after, in the Just fall after. after. Um, but the, it was still a thing people were talking about, the Women's Collective, the GSA, the campus. Um, so how did you get that reputation that I'm not Lisa encountered? Well, um, I, Tim Chase actually wrote, there was a pro and con editorial 
on Denim Day, which I want to emphasize, it was not pro or con gay rights. It was it was about the validity of of the protest or the action the support. Oh. of the action. And I and I and um, I may have written something. I you know I, I was just churning out coffee, so I I, I don't know specifically what I wrote. <laughs> Uh, uh, over the years, though, you know, there was. Can someone let me know? I, the video looks choppy to me um, on the playback of the stream. Um, can you confirm that it was choppy? Also choppy for you. Um, it might just be this video, and so I might not be able to play from here. If if I can't, then I will um, I will switch it over to the uh, event recording that has some clips from this video. You know, it was a time. It was a uh, a lot of. Uh, we all wanted to be Hunter S. Thompson rolled into John Belushi rolled into Carl Bernstein. So, yeah, no, it's it's doing the same thing where this video just doesn't want to play cleanly. Um, <clears throat> let me go to one of their clips in here. Because this video played OK. She was the one who outed me to Mark. She blew my cover. Um, so how did that go? How, what was this? What's the story there? That was, um, she was looking for a place to, to live. And I had just met up with um, some lesbians and we were going to have a house, rent a house. And so I felt for whatever reason, the, the need to um, let her know, to be honest, that, you know, there were going to be lesbians living there. And if that bothered her, I wanted her to know ahead of time. But please don't tell my brother. I'm not out. Yeah, well, that didn't work. So it was like at midnight, I think after his, uh, one of his night shows, that I get this call. I was in Ambler Johnston. And, um, it was which, like, is, which is hilarious because oh, yeah. my father, Ambler Johnston was a- uh, uh, Sixth floor. Was uh, uh, girls only. Virgin Vault, they called it. Virgin <laughs> Vault. And the my top two floors. My father uh, yes. put her in there specifically to keep her away from boys. <laughs> and so... <laughs> right? I know the irony, right? The irony. <laughs> yeah. He was worried about them boys getting a hold of you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so he put you in the virgin vault. Exactly. <laughs> Which was perfect. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. So, yeah. So, so yeah. So Mark wasn't too happy about it. Um, pretty upset about it. And what? Yeah. Well, now, come and, on. Be fair. Oh, because of it's gonna kill our mother. You're gonna kill our mother. This is gonna kill her. It's gonna kill her. How can you do this to your mother? Bah, 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 yeah. bah, bah, bah. Uh, that's true. I didn't. I didn't care. I didn't have an opinion about your sexuality. But you sure were. I, I mean, I was I only scared. I was scared. I was only cared, concerned about our mother. That's all. Yeah. Handling it. Right. Right. No, but you scared me that night. I, you know, it was like, damn. That was my first coming out experience, really, in terms of, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. And it was like, fuck. <laughs> this is, I don't know if I can handle this or not. So, yeah. So that was, that yeah, was, I was being protective from all, but I never once, you know, oh. tried to change your mind or right. criticize you for True. being gay or whatever. True. Because it, it really was a kind of, you know, it was the, the 70s were still yeah. the leftover 60s. It was kind of like live and let live. Mm -hmm. right. And I believe that. Everybody yeah. should be happy. Just don't but mess with my mother. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. It was interesting of 
you know, the fa losing the family dynamic, losing the, the, um, that Christian family um, was quite a bit. And really the only group that really stuck with me was the, the women I met at Women's Space. They, they, were, my, they were my community. So they really did step up. And they originally engaged you as the sister of... Mark Barroso. <laughs> Mark Barroso. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so did that, did yes. that actually require any, like, um, getting over, or was it just an observation? I, th I think they thought it was, was just hilarious yeah. that Mark Barroso would have a lesbian sister. Just, you know... In that and, and I and I had heard stories of of him and um, in in the activism or in the CT. Um, what stories? I guess stuff you must have written. I don't know, but that's what I remember no. was that you had made an you you had made it known of kind of like the for denim day, like there were some of the guys wore skirts in protest, um, or they wore or in support. A, wearing a skirt on denim day? Hell no! You're supposed to wear your denim. Don't think you no. What? <laughs> I'm trying to rewrite history here. Come I, on. I see that. Work with me. No, not this one. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a lot, but not this one. <laughs> Damn it. Yeah. Yeah. So so it was in, so I learned uh, a lot about my brother um, from them. So yeah. So Mark, what was what did you write? What did you, how did you were, you were on Tet Tech for Denim Day. Lisa came after, right? Just after, in the Just fall after. after. Um, but the, it was still a thing people were talking about, the Women's Collective, the GSA, the campus. Um, so how did you get that reputation that I'm not Lisa encountered? Well, um, I, Tim Chase actually wrote, there was a pro and con editorial on Denim Day, which I want to emphasize, it was not pro or con gay rights. It was it was about the validity of, of the protest or their action support. Oh. of the action. And I and I and um, I may have written something. I you know I, I was just churning out copy, so I I, I don't know specifically what I wrote <laughs> uh, uh, over the years. Though you know there was. You know, it was a time, it was a, uh, a lot of, uh, we all wanted to be Hunter S. Thompson rolled into John Belushi, rolled into Carl Bernstein. So it was a real schizophrenic uh, persona I had. Yeah. I might be writing an investigative piece one week, and the next week I'm writing some off-color humor. It's probably, the off-color humor was probably what got me in trouble. Probably. With I, your I could friends. see that. I could see that. Yeah, I could see you doing that. But <laughs> I know in our editorial meeting, so we would all discuss uh, the position the paper was going to take, and there was a split. And I agreed with Tim. I thought Denim Day was a dumb idea uh, because to me it was like saying, "If you support gay rights, wear shoes." You know, why don't you do something? Uh, you know, pink shirt or something that identified you as a, a supporter of, of gay rights. And um, so it was more of a technical objection I had. Um, of picking denim, de like yeah, jeans, like, like that's your normal. Yeah, God damn it, that's mine. Can't take my clothes. <laughs> oh, I get it now. I get it now. All right. Like the pink ribbon for breast cancer kind of thing. Yeah. Don't, don't link those two together. Yeah. And see, but again, this is hmm. like I didn't get it that the point was to start a dialogue, and I think that's, if I understand correctly, uh, the point was mm -hmm. uh, to start a discussion um, between supporters and maybe non-supporters. Just get people talking about uh, these invisible people among us. <clears throat> True. Right. Right. Well, which is a good thing. I didn't understand that at the time. Uh, but that was the point. Right. Uh, I thought the point was to make a show, mm. you know. And uh, so I was wrong. 
you know, and, uh, but Sherry Wood, who was the editor, wrote the pro uh, Denim Day editorial. I think she's going to be here. I think so. I think you're all going to interview her by Skype or something. But um, I think I saw she her was at she was uh, she was ahead of her time. Mm -hmm. You know, except for you know not keeping my request. <laughs> oh, Same. that's that's. <laughs> <laughs> that, okay, got it. I'm connecting the dots. Just saying. Just saying. Just let her know. <laughs> but uh, so anyway, um, that was my take on Denim Day. Does that make sense? Yeah. So was was it Sherry's argument that helped to uh, evolve your understanding of what they were attempting to do, or is that something you came upon later, after the fact? Well, I'm a slow learner. You have to plant an idea in my head, and it has to be fertilized and watered before it spreads. So I think um, Denim Day and Sherry's article made me begin thinking about it more. And, of course, having a gay sister uh, kind of made me think about it more. Now I think I understand why she told you, because she knew how your opposition and from your perspective, so... She probably did out me just because of it would help you maybe. I don't oh. you know what I'm saying? Oh. Right? Okay. Like like, hey Mark, you're such a jerk about queers. <laughs> Guess what? Your <laughs> sister's queer, Mark Barroso. I was not a jerk about queers. I I was really a live and let live guy. I didn't understand the whole I just didn't understand. No, but you have a way gay. Of, but you have a way of speaking with yeah. Yeah. Gruff. Rawr. 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 Yeah. What am I, Mr. McGruff or something? Maybe. <laughs> so they uh, they do a little bit of banter in their interview. Um, and he tries to claim that he wasn't one of the ones wearing the skirt. And that he didn't write the opposition piece for the Collegiate Times. Um, but it kind of, he sort of admits to it uh, when he says, I was wrong. That's about the best that we could get. And honestly, we weren't trying to push him. This was um, giving them space to tell their story. And so um, it it's very clear that if he was one of the people in opposition to Denim Day in 1979, his views on the subject of... Um, LGBTQ plus rights have evolved over time. Um, and so we will uh, acknowledge that. Um, let's see, who should we drop in on now? Uh, let's pop in on this interview with Ed Sewell. Um, it looks like this one is transcribed but not indexed. Uh, so I'm going to pick a random spot, and we'll see if it'll play. Ed Sewell was a professor at Virginia Tech um, during Denim Day. That looks like a good starting point. Beans. Um, were there many faculty who... Back Beans. Just a little bit. Um, were there many... You would... You would if there, there would be people that you would see several times during the day... It was obvious that they had gone home and changed clothes mm -hmm. just to have the right or not have to not have the right <laughs> color or the wrong color, whichever way you wanted mm -hmm. to look at it. Um, but there really wasn't much discussion on campus about it. Uh, it wasn't something the uh, newspaper talked about, for instance, right. as was the case <clears throat> here. So on Denim Day, then, you wore jeans. Um, were there many faculty who made a statement one way or the other, like hmm. specifically didn't wear or chose to support? Well, I'd say, first of all, not many faculty members wore jeans at the time. Hmm. It was a more, uh, they were more likely to wear khakis or, or trousers or um, with a shirt and tie or a coat. Uh, was not nearly as informal a dress code. And I would usually wear jeans with a, uh, a shirt and tie. Mm -hmm. 
uh, which was appropriate. Um, I didn't know or have discussion with any other faculty member. But at that time, I didn't know any other faculty member who was openly gay or lesbian. By that time, I had tenure. Mm -hmm. And I do know that there would, there were, later I, in discussions, there were faculty members who certainly would not mention anything about it or any relationship with students or any other faculty until they had tenure because they, there was the, the fear, and that's what it was, the fear that it would be a negative uh, aspect of their tenure decision. And so mm -hmm. there, there really, I, I didn't know any faculty who were open. There were some around. And later on I said, oh, okay, I know who you are now. Yeah. Um, but, was that fear founded yeah. in any event? No, I think it was a fear founded just by the the general social um, and the idea that it's not acceptable. I think it also goes along with the idea with, within academics that uh, you shouldn't bring your personal life into the classroom. Mm-hmm or in relationship to students. Uh, unfortunately, I think when you're teaching interpersonal communication and persuasion, that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, and the same thing would be true if you're teaching literature or sociology or psychology. It, it's hard to, you know, you may be able to discuss chemistry and physics and mathematics without bringing up social mm -hmm. uh, standing issues hard to do if you're in the uh, social behavioral sciences or humanities. And I was really admittedly quite surprised the first time I went to a uh, gay men's party. Uh, some people were surprised to see me, but I was just as surprised to see them. So people you knew and who knew you. People that I knew but. and who knew me, yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, it was kind of like, oh, you're here. Oh. I didn't know you would be here. <laughs> so it was kind of an interesting experience. And admittedly a little frightening at first, too. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> Ed's interview is slightly different than the others, uh, given his different perspective. Um, as a professor here during Denim Day, um, he was uh, the professor who actually held the panels. Um, that we talked about earlier. Uh, he brought students into his class um, to just have a discussion about uh, gays and lesbians um, and introduce to his students the dreaded homosexual as an individual and an actual human. Um, I would love to show you Olga's interview, but it is not fully processed yet. Um, that's the time scale on which editing things like this happens. Um, these interviews were recorded in 2000. Well, we started planning for it in 2018. They were recorded in 2019. Um, but there's a long tail on a project like this, so. Uh, let's see, I've got Sue Ann, Steve, and Steve that we haven't looked at, um, and a few minutes left. Let me pop in and see if any of them are indexed. Uh, that's possible. Let's look at uh, both Sue Ann and Steve Critchfield, um, Sue Ann Brown and Steve Critchfield talk a little bit about the legacy of Denim Day. So let's listen to their thoughts on looking back at Denim Day, if the videos will play properly. What do you think would happen if they tried to do a Denim Day in 2019? Well, I think we're about to find out. 
<laughs> What's your guess? What will, what will the campus look like? I think it will be much more denim than we saw that day, certainly. Okay, so we were talking about what, what do you think Denim Day 2019 will look like? I think it will definitely look very different. I mean, we, we have come a long way in... <laughs> She's only adding to it. <laughs> well, I think it, it will definitely look a lot different than, than it did 40 years ago. I, I would hope that we would see significantly more denim and, and both casual denim because that's what everybody was going to wear and they're just not even paying attention and don't feel as compelled to have a negative response, um, and a lot more denim that is in support. I mean, certainly we, we've come a long way in 40 years. I'm not naive enough to think that there won't be somebody, you know, there's lots of folks that still would not be that supportive and, and may be inclined to not wear denim. But better than it was. And partly because, because of the efforts of, of everyone through the years to raise awareness and um, come a long way. Yeah. Maybe now supporting Garrett's will be as natural for most people as putting on jeans. That would be wonderful. I love that. <clears throat> Maybe now supporting gay rights will be as natural for everyone as putting on jeans. Uh, and I do think that that would be wonderful. Um, we'll take a quick glance at Steve Critchfield's uh, thoughts on Denim Day and its impact. Um, I don't know if it'll play. We're going to try. Stepping back, then, mm -hmm. for a minute, to the discussion around Denim Day. Right. You talked about the sp sort of split in the planning in terms of the, well, we're just going to make people mad and annoy them, and then and the, well, that's what we want to do. Where did you fall there? I think <coughs> at first I probably just it didn't make you know why are we doing this? Yeah, you know, wouldn't it be better to put. I think back then we had these tri pink triangles or you know just something that was. Uh -huh. um, but I can't remember who it was. It was a guy and a girl. They were tech um, students, and they were probably the activists. But once they explained in detail why we were doing it, that the point was to make people feel uncomfortable, the point was to make them mad, the point was to inconvenience them, because we have to go through that every day. Mm -hmm. um, and there was discussions about the difference between gays and blacks because it was easier for a gay to hide than a black. Mm -hmm. And then they were talking about, well, okay, gays are more similar to folks that are Jewish because you didn't have to tell people you were Jewish. Um, so there was all this discussion going on. And, but the key thing is by the time they got done discussing it, I don't think there was anybody in the room that, that was against it. Yeah. Again, I think the problem was the group should have probably spent a little bit more time, I mean, planning Denim Day and how it was all going to work and getting the word out there. That was the fun part. Yeah. We probably should have spent more time figuring out how we were going to educate why we were doing it on the student population before we did it because – we, you know, you only have a day or two after Denim Day happens to really educate yeah. the student population because after that, you know, two, three days later, 
Who cares? Yeah. Did you have any conversations after the fact with non-gay students who oh yeah about what they're? I mean, I mean that was the the whole conversation over in the ad quad. Of course, no one knew yeah. I was gay. You know, they they would um, out at AGR. I mean. I used to hang out there all the time. They tease each other because they had jeans on. Even even to a year later, mm-hmm. you know, that's a nice pair of blue jeans you got on, boy. <laughs> so it became part of the the joke, the yeah. greater joke. And did that then confirm for you that the point didn't land as strongly as it could have? <sighs> I think. I don't think they people, I just don't think most people got it. Mm-hmm. They didn't understand what it was all about. What they what they remember was is jeans, support gay rights. I don't even think a lot, I mean, a lot of the people in agriculture, I don't even think they thought, of, thought much about it at all. I mean, I don't think they were necessarily anti-gay rights. It's just it was something totally new. It was a whole new movement at the point in time. Yeah. I, I, just, I just think it was just more of a, and I'm sure you've experienced and other things, but you know, you you poke funds at your friends, you, you make fun of them for um, the things that that are probably not the socially most acceptable, but you do. And back then, uh, it was largely sociable acceptable to, you know, yeah, say, yeah, are you a fancy guy to your buddies, even though you you were ninety percent sure they weren't. You just yeah. called them out, right? So I don't, you know, again, in the, uh, I can remember the day that the denim day thing was, um, I had to go to the bank because I worked part time at that bank. Um, and so at one thirty, I had to leave class and go to the bank. I'm there. I had to put a suit on. I mean, I couldn't, didn't have a denim suit and you had to wear a suit and stuff, but I can remember working the drive in window. And uh, I'd see friends wearing khakis walking up and down University Boulevard, and I had the the PA mic. And I'd be like, hey, Randy, <laughs> you're better dressed than I've ever seen you. You know, it would <laughs> birch out over the uh, the thing. Which bank was this? Where, uh, where in town? Univer- it, was, it was now it's BB&T over oh, okay. here by the I, foundation yeah, right. office. And so you could see the you know University Boulevard. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember one friend of mine who I know was straight because uh, I've noticed his girlfriend and now his wife, and we're still friends, but he was walking up. I mean, he was just a total civil engineer, oblivious to everything. He probably didn't even know denim day was going on. <laughs> and I got the PA system, and I'm like, uh, hey, Hanson. And he's like looking around. This is God. <laughs> <laughs> Should you have those jeans on them today? You know, like just 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 doing stuff like that. And he's looking around. And he's like, you, you know. <laughs> so, it even I got to at that point in time, you know, was poking fun at everything because mm-hmm. that's what you do. So, is that something you did often with the PA? Yeah, <laughs> I had I had a good time. <laughs> I remember one time Arthur Squires and. His boyfriend were walking from I think it was the Holiday Inn back then, and uh, they were walking to Kroger's or something. And I'd be like, "Doctor Squires, you have a message from God. She's pissed. <laughs> you know, just stuff like that. I'd have fun. My my branch manager would get annoyed at me sometimes. But, yeah, I get. <laughs> but oh well, that had nothing with. Nothing to do with me being fired, though, because it was not my review. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, I, I just remember the denim day thing at the ag quad. I Because I was only on the ag quad that whole day, and then I had to get dressed, go mm-hmm. to work. And uh, everybody was mad that day or feeling inconvenienced. or I, I can remember a lot of my friends. Uh, God, I can't remember what his name was. He was from Rockingham County. He goes, I'm going to skip my damn English class today because I got to go walk across the drill field. Now, I'm not walking across the drill field in blue jeans. You know, so he skipped class. Mm. Um, he was okay in the ad quad because he knew everybody. Um, but uh, 
but I would definitely say by the weekend, at least at AGR and at least in the ag classes, block and bridle, um, <clears throat> it, it had become a joke. So, I mean, I think we'll stop it there. Um, there's plenty more in the interviews. Uh, a lot of them talk about their personal lives leading up to Denim Day. Um, uh, you get a little bit of history of them. They talk about where they went after Virginia Tech, what brought them to Virginia Tech, and they go in depth on um, what what Denim Day was like, the planning for it, the reaction to it, um, what it was like at Virginia Tech after the reaction to it with the thousands and thousands of letters of protest the arguments flying back and forth in the Collegiate Times, which is the, the school newspaper. Um, it's it's a very interesting story, and um, if you're at all interested in it, I highly encourage you to visit the website and uh, take a look at the videos. Everything that we've got processed is available just to stream from the website. Um, it's all hosted through the university's Kaltura platform, which is why the videos were buffering. Um, they, Kaltura just buffers occasionally. The server just can't keep up with the videos sometimes. Um, I'm not sure why the other videos didn't want to play well over stream. Uh, everything was shot in 4K, but some of the stuff, um, the, the videos we had trouble with were shot remotely um, by other people using different equipment. So it probably had something to do with the video production. Anyway, uh, we're going to call that for today. Um, that will be a stream. Thank you, everybody who stopped by. Thank you, 16-Bit uh, Eric, for the raid um, and Ray Faye for the bits. Thank you for joining me as we explored uh, some LGBTQ plus history here at Virginia Tech through the Denim Day Oral History Project. Um, next week, the plan is to continue with LGBTQ plus history at Virginia Tech. I will probably be pulling out the Mark Weber papers or the Hokie Pride papers. I don't remember which ones, uh, but we will um, have some actual like physical documents from Virginia Tech LGBTQ plus history to take a gander at. Um, so that is the plan for next week. I need to go ahead and set up some rating to occur. Um, let's see who is around that. We want to go and say hello to. Um, don't think usually I end up tossing it over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. They don't appear to be uh, streaming at the moment. Um, so we'll set up a raid to the North Carolina State University Libraries from the Libraries channel. I cannot unfortunately raid them from my personal channel. Uh, We'll try, yeah, it because of the way they have raids set up. So from my personal channel, we will go and say hello to the first person we ever raided on this show, which is Stephen Kill. Um, uh, Stephen Kilbride, uh, who is a lovely streamer um, with a number of librarians who visit his chat. So... Uh, See if I can get the raid to work. <laughs> Currently playing a lovely um, dog sledding game on this channel. Oh, there we go. All right. So thank you again, everybody, for stopping by for today's show. Um, I will see you all again here next Wednesday at 2.30, where we will continue some exploration of LGBTQ plus history at Virginia Tech. And um, if you're at all interested tomorrow night at, uh, tomorrow night on this channel, um, there's a talk back for a TTRPG show that we do on Fridays. Thanks. Bye.